Good morning, Facebook. Welcome to bringing the zoo to you here at Brookfield Zoo. Again, thank you for joining us and thank you for your continued support. My name's Craig. I'm an animal care specialist here at the Hamill Play Zoo, Wild Encounters, and our ambassador program. Today, I'd like to introduce you to some of my favorite types of animals, some of our ambassadors, snakes. So we're over here, we're gonna start with animal care specialist, Manelia, and she's got one of our baby corn snakes. So making his or her debut, this is sword, sword, like the weapon, I know. Um, she's about, she or she is about a year and a half now. Next to me is one of our biggest boys. This is with Jill and Olivia. This is our Burmese Python Atticus, and he's approximately nine to 10 years old. Still got some growing to do. Over here with Francine, we have our Kenyan sand boa lasagna. Um, named because she has this nice, looks like the top layer of a lasagna, very delicious, right? Mm -hmm. And then lastly, you may all know Scott. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Casper, of course, our leucistic ball python. So today I want to talk to you guys a little bit about some similarities and differences between these guys. While yes, they're all snakes, all different types of snakes, they have a lot of really cool and different features as well. So some of the main things you'll know about snakes, yes, they're reptiles. So they're covered in scales. Um, they lay eggs, although there will be some uh, contra contradictions to that, which we can discuss. And um, they're all cold-blooded. Mainly, again, there's, there's a few outliers there too, but cold-blooded, so they don't regulate their own body temperature. They uh, depend on the environment around them. We'll determine what their body temperature is. Um, again, another common thing with snakes, how they move. Of course, they don't have arms and legs, so they slither around on the ground or climbing up in trees. They use those scales, especially on the underside, which you can see a good look of Atticus's scales here um, to get around. And if you're watching Atticus a little closely, he might stick out his tongue. So that's how, primarily how snakes will find their food. They use their tongue to smell. Um, they bring those scent particles back into their mouth. They have an organ called the Jacobson's organ that processes the smells that they are collecting. Um, again, uh, they don't have ears, at least in the sense that you would think of. They do have these structures for like an inner ear. So they um, can feel vibrations in the ground, and that's kind of how they can quote unquote hear things. Looks like uh, Olivia's struggling to hang on to Atticus <laughs> over here. Sorry, I think I scared him a little. Yeah, just a little. Yeah. He's just, he's heavy. He's, he's about big. 50 pounds now. He's not even full grown yet. He's gonna keep going. So those are some of the, you know, common snake things that uh, you know, most people know. So, so now I want to talk about some of the differences. We're going to start over here with Sword, our, our little baby corn snake here. So uh, these guys are pretty common. You can find them um, in rural areas uh, across the U.S. They're really cool actually to have around, similar to like garter snakes and stuff like that. They're um, good at catching prey uh, and we want them around because they are a good natural pest control. But they also make uh, pretty popular pets too. So you see these guys pretty commonly. Um, they're pretty, pretty docile animals, uh, especially if you handle them enough. We've been handling our babies here since uh, they were born, uh, after we got them eating properly, of course. And they were born around June in 2019. So they're about a year and a half old. And these guys can live 15, 20 so years uh, under professional care. Why are they called corn snakes? They're called corn snake. Well, they have a couple different things. You can tend to find them a lot in corn fields. They do, they're good natural pest control. They like to eat the mice and stuff that will eat crops. Uh, but if you look underneath too, um, you see like the, the coloration yeah. there. It kind of looks like maize or corn, yeah. right? So you can see he, he or she's kind of, we don't know the sex yet. He or she's kind of checking stuff out, um, using that tongue flicking and, uh, you know, just exploring. But again, very calm while she is active. I'm probably going to keep saying she, but while she's active, because she's cute, uh, she will be using her tongue just to, you know, check everything out. Um, but she's not nervous. You can tell um, a corn snake, they have this neat ability to, uh, when they're nervous or when they sense predators, 
they'll flick their tails, um, especially like in leaves or something, to make a rattly sound to try and scare off predators. It's a type of mimicry. Um, but you can see she's calm. She's just slowly moving around and just exploring. Now over here, on the opposite end, we have our Burmese python. This is Atticus. So again, I told you he's not full grown. He's just about 10, he just measured in at 10 feet long, about 50 pounds. He's probably gonna gain a few more feet or so when he hits full grown. But when I started here about six years ago, he was probably a little bit longer than an adult corn snake, a little, a little bit uh, thicker. Because he was a little guy. Um, again, we do a lot of handling with him. So he's very, you might hear him hissing a little bit. That's actually pr mostly just him breathing out, uh, especially since we're supporting a lot of his weight. Um, as they get bigger, they're not really uh, into climbing anymore. They tend to sit on the ground a lot. Um, but he's still in between. He's still size-wise uh, a little bit adolescent. So he will, he's still pretty active and he does a lot of climbing. But we handle him frequently so that he's, you know, easy to work with. Um, he's not afraid of us. We're not afraid of him. He's comfortable being picked up. He does take multiple keepers to safely carry him now. Um, so these guys uh, on the opposite end, like I was talking about with the corn snake, um, are pretty popular as far as pets go too because they're pretty, pretty chill. Um, they're impressive animals and when you get them when they're young, they're, um, they're, they're small and they're easy to work with, but what people don't realize is how big these guys will actually get and the level of care that it takes um, to take care of these guys, whether it's feeding or having a proper enclosure. Um, light bulbs for <laughs> reptiles can be expensive, all of that stuff. So these guys aren't recommended as, as uh, pets just because you know it, people don't know what they're getting into when they buy them and snakes start out really, really small and adorable. Not saying that he's not cute because look at that little face. Um, but again, uh, if you were wanting to, you know, purchase a snake as a pet or adopt a snake, something like a corn snake, or even uh, ca like Casper, a ball python, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute, would be a little bit better option. And so what happens too, though, um, I'm sure you've heard these guys are not naturally from the United States at all. They're from uh, Myanmar area. But uh, these guys are pretty prevalent right now in, in Florida, like in the Everglades, and that's because people will get these things when they're small and easy to handle, and then when they can't take care of them anymore, they've been releasing them. So that's an invasive species now, and with no natural predators, these guys were able to thrive and reproduce. And as you can see, he's a pretty big animal here, and they say that uh, the snake can handle prey about the size of the thickest part of its body. So right now this guy could eat like rabbits, um, potentially small dogs and cats, but as they get bigger, they've been known to handle, you know, much bigger animals too, which wouldn't be their normal part of their diet in Florida. So, mm. so uh, what's the difference between how a corn snake would eat its prey and a python? That's an excellent question. All of these snakes that you're going to see and that you're seeing now are all constrictors. So even though they're all different sizes, they, um, with the exception of lasagna a little bit, they, um, they tackle their prey in the same way. They're gonna, uh, they're gonna wait, basically. They're called ambush predators, and they just sit and wait. They can hold perfectly still. Um, you can see the different color patterns um, help them blend in to where they're supposed to be from. Um, and they'll wait for prey to come across. They will strike it, and they'll wrap their, wrap their bodies around it, and they'll squeeze it, um, suffocating it, and then they swallow it whole. Now, a venomous snake, wouldn't be as long or as girthy because they don't have to grab their prey like that. They, of course, would bite their prey and inject venom. It would die and then they would eat it. So, Moving over here, we have our Kenyan sand boa. This is lasagna. This is a really, really cool animal. Um, again, another species that tends to be pretty, uh, pretty popular because they're very chill. Um, but she kind of is different shaped, uh, different size, different looking all in general. So you get to see why these guys are called the Kenyan, or the sand boa. Um, let's see if she does it. It's really cool to watch. There she goes. So they have like a little blunt face. It almost has a little upturned part in her nose to help her uh, burrow down. Um, you can't see her eyes now, but their eyes tend to be a little bit higher up on their head. Um, and so that she can bury underneath and she can poke her little head out just enough so she can see and um, smell things. 
And what they do is, um, as she's burying herself, she'll, uh, when she's starting to feel hungry, she'll kind of hang out a little bit more out of the sand, at least so she can watch and smell and see things. And when she finds something that she can eat, she'll grab it and try and go under with it. And she'll swallow it that way. Look at her go. <laughs> so she's uh, mostly full grown. We would expect her to get quite a bit uh, girthier as uh, as she grows, but she's about what would we say seven, Francine, seven or eight years old, maybe. She's five years old. Five years old. So yeah, <laughs> we have so many snakes, guys. That, uh, it's hard to remember some of these numbers. Um, but one of the neat things about this, the sand boa compared to the other three snakes here, and you'll see it with a lot of other boa species, is how they give birth. So most snakes are what we call oviparous, which means they lay eggs. Now, somebody like certain mammals or people are called viviparous, which means they give live birth. But now these snakes are kind of like an in-between where they're called ovoviviparous, which means that they have eggs inside their body, but those, when they're ready to be born, will hatch inside, and then the snake will give birth to live young. So, pretty cool. Look at her go, super cute. And then over here, uh, again, we have Scott. <laughs> Keeper Scott. And, uh, but more importantly, we have Casper, and I know a lot of you guys who follow us know Casper. She is our leucistic ball python. So she's pretty similar to Atticus um, as far as biology goes. They're, these are one of the smaller species of python. Um, and uh, again, Casper is different because she's leucistic, which means she doesn't have any pigment or pattern. Um, but not albino, because an albino snake would have uh, the reddish eyes. And albino snakes still have a pattern, but you'll see like yellows and whites and stuff mixed into there. Now the neat thing about the python which, again, you could have seen it on Atticus, but it's uh, more prevalent on Casper here are these little heat pits. So you'll see across, at the tip of her nose, those are nostrils. They don't smell with those nostrils, they breathe with them, but then on her upper lip, you'll see all those pits. And that lets her sense body heat. So she has another good way of hunting for prey. She can sense the body heat that those prey animals are giving off. And she's enjoying her uh, pegboard here. And as you can see, um, while all of our animals we don't, uh, aren't really releasable, especially since they're so used to us, Casper definitely is not because she does not have any camouflage. You can see her very well up against this naturalistic uh, pegboard here. If we were to put you know, maybe Atticus or a regular ball python up there, it might be harder for it to find them on there, but for Casper, she cannot really hide unless she lived in the snow, but in which case she can't live in the snow because of other reasons. So, <laughs> uh, so how come, or how can, rather, mm -hmm. how can lasagna breathe under the sand? Well, that's a good question. So a lot of uh, reptiles, they don't have to breathe as frequently or as often as like a human, and you'll see that with uh, turtles too. They can hold their breath for a long, long time. Um, that being said, I don't know how well she actually breathes in the sand. They don't burrow super deep. Um, and then of course she can poke her head out uh, whenever she needs to to catch some breath as well. Okay. So do snakes make noises other than the air that uh... <laughs> <laughs> that Atticus is expelling over there? As far as I know, no. <laughs> they shouldn't be making noises. Um, they, you don't really see them breathing, except maybe um, on a big snake like Atticus, you can kind of see his muscles contracting as he breathes. Um, but you won't see evidence of that. You won't hear it, uh, typically, unless they might have um, a respiratory issue or, or something like that. But again, with Atticus, it's just like kind of like a lot of sighing as he's uh, he sh normally would be um, laying flat on the ground, but we're holding him so he breathes a little heavier. If someone were to get a snake as a pet, would that snake get along with dogs and cats? <laughs> that's um, that's a good question. So I think the bigger issue would be the cat or the dog, 
more than anything, um, from personal experience, I have a pet snake at home, and uh, he pretty much ignores my cat. Uh, the, the snake, he's a smaller snake, he's a ball python too, so um, he knows he can't really eat my cat, so I don't think he really cares, um, unless the cat was messing with him, then he might try and get away or uh, try and scare the cat off. How long uh, do these snakes typically live? It depends on the snake. So these Burmese pythons, for example, they've uh, been known to live upwards of 30 years under professional care, um, which is a pretty long time, but a smaller snake, not so much. So like the corn snakes, a good estimate would be 15 to 20. I mean, again, there can be um, some outliers that go a little higher than that. Uh, same with the ball python, around 20 years or so, but it, it depends. So if someone did decide to get one as a pet. They should be aware yes. that they're going to be a very long You're going to have them animal. for a while. It's not like a turtle or maybe a parrot, but they are a commitment. Um, so make sure you know what you're getting into before you uh, and ad adopt one. So, so do constrictors typically bite? They do. They'll bite. They'll tend to bite first um and then wrap their butt so like the biting mm -hmm. would grab the animal and kind of pin it in place so that gives them an opportunity to wrap around okay. it uh how often do you feed them it depends on the snake so um a full-grown snake we might not feed as often but we will feed um bigger at each meal but for like a uh, sword over here they get fed she and her siblings will get fed uh twice a week and the, the diet is always changing as they're growing, so we'll, we'll kind of, we monitor weight. They get weight every couple weeks to make sure they're growing properly. We'll take the measurements to make sure they're growing lengthwise properly. Um, and we're constantly adjusting the diet based on um, that and based on the size of them around here. So right now, she's actually eating small mice, but when they were born, uh, first born, they were eating something as small as a pinky, which are like day old mice. Aww. Whereas Atticus over here, well, he is still growing also, so we do constantly monitor his weight as well, and um, we'll adjust his diet as needed. But um, where we look at lasagna over here, um, the only time we really change anything in her diet is if for some reason she's gaining or losing weight, or um, if she decides she doesn't want to eat certain items, we might try different things out to keep her going. But snakes will typically tend to fast too, like during certain seasons. Um, and that can be affected by differences in temperatures or differences in, in light cycles. And that's how, like even though we try and keep everything constant with these guys, little changes like that can make them uh, choose to do that kind of stuff. And again, it's not anything that's concerning, but we will just keep an eye on them and monitor weights and make sure that the reason why they're not eating is uh, due to a fast, which they shouldn't lose a lot of weight if they are choosing to fast. How often do they shed? Again, that depends on the snake, um, the type of snake or species of snake, uh, whether it's full grown or still growing. So we look at Atticus, Atticus probably sheds every couple months. And again, he's still growing, but he's a larger snake too. So he'll, he'll, go, he'll shed, he'll, he'll go into shed every two months. We call that going blue because their, um, their eyes will cloud over at some point as their, the, the old shed is separating from the body to, to peel off. And it will take him uh, a couple weeks of being quote unquote blue before he starts to shed. Now, um, these corn snakes over here, they're still really young and they're small. So they shed uh, f more frequently than, than uh, Atticus would. But they're, the time it takes for them to go blue and then completely remove all that is much shorter as well. So. All right. How many types of snakes are there? In the world? Yeah. There are so many. And, you know, I, we don't even know. They're discovering new ones every day. And I feel like every day I'm like, holy moly, look at this new snake. <laughs> I saw this really cool one recently. It's got, like, this little tail that they can move it around. It almost looks like an insect or a bug, and they use that to attract um, what their prey would be, but in this case, whatever would prey upon a little bug, and then when it comes down to grab their tail, they grab it. And it is so cool, and it's really neat to see just the different features and different adaptations all these animals have. 
Again, these are all types of snakes, but they're all completely different, which is just, it, it's astound, astounding, so. Okay, well, how many kinds of snakes do we have at Wild Encounters, Play Zoo, etc.? All right, so here at Wild Encounters and our Hamel Play Zoo and our Ambassador Program. So if you come into the Hamel Play Zoo at Zoo at Home, you'll see our one of our many corn snakes or our king snakes or our brown house snake. On exhibit right behind Scott is our Dumeril's boa constrictor, that's Medusa. And then Atticus lives here in the play zoo around the back corner. And then across from Atticus, you'll see Casper. And that's just in the play zoo. <laughs> now, if you run on over to our ambassador area where we keep some of our other animals behind the scenes for programming, we have another ball python, Casper's sister, Marceline. You might have seen her recently. And that's where lasagna lives. And that might be it. I think yeah. that's it. But well, there's always room for more. And <laughs> if somebody says, Craig, you want some more snakes in your department, I'm going to say yes. <laughs> and we do have snakes in other areas too, correct? Yes, we have a lot of snakes. I don't even know how many. Uh, yeah, um, we, I don't even know if the reptile staff know how many <laughs> different kinds. Yeah, they, they have quite a few really so cool many. snakes. And they've got some of the ones that I wouldn't be handling uh, in front of guests either, but they're really cool to go see on exhibit. What's your favorite snake fact? Snake fact. That's tricky. I could talk about snakes all day. So I always have to, when I do a snake chat, I have to come up with a theme so that I limit it to certain things and then <laughs> I answer questions later. Um, Brumation. Brumation. <laughs> Brumation's cool. It's like a type of hibernation that they'll go into. And we actually had to, in order, because we bred our corn snakes here, that's where we got these babies. And um, like I said before, uh, snakes will do certain things based off of um, uh, season. And while our animals are kept in a controlled space, they don't, some of these things they don't really pick up on. And so in order for us to have bred these corn snakes, we wanted to put them into a brumation um, which is like a type of hibernation and so um, we set up new enclosures where we reduce the heat a little bit to kind of force them to um, slow down we change their light cycles drastically and that kind of put them into that that brumation period so that when they woke up we can start feeding them and get them ready for a breeding season all right well Thank you guys for joining us today. I hope you guys learned a lot about snakes. They're one of my favorite animals. And we hope that you come visit us as soon as everything's opened up and get to see all of our cool guys here. Again, thank you for joining us. Thank you for supporting us and uh, have a good day.